by not reading a paper, but actually talking, by presenting. And if, if the God thinks he's moving into cinema, I'm trying to produce the opposite, the opposite run into his world, um, which is, uh, as a film studies scholar who's, who's now moving into, who has been moving slowly as, as if it were a side show for me, but it's actually a pretty major show, on uh, working on uh, what I would call the moving image in the gallery place. So that's sort of where my interest is, partly. Um, partly, I say, because I'm still... So just to set it up, I know a couple of you heard me yesterday, but I do feel I, I'm obliged to set up a bit of uh, where my work is these days. I was... I've now... I've been working on this... Uh, working on um, experimental film and video practices in India, and I had actually gone to gone to India on a, on a two-year research, which, was, which formalized some time before then the move into thinking about art and moving image. Okay, so this was in, so then the, the archive became really big and I was already writing in so many different directions. So one direction is, of course, I go back to what I always do, which is, I mean, not always do, I should say, work on film, which I think of as a book-length project. And my stuff in art has taken the form of essays. So I'm actually going to, run through this to understand what is somebody like me interested in, in moving image, just as cinema has moved into so many different areas. That is, it has indeed, to a large extent, not only, I mean, has been sort of making claims on leaving celluloid, but also moving into very different directions on how we, how we watch this thing called cinema, which when you move into the gallery space and trying to think, which I'm, I'm just stating the obvious for all of you, so it's the thing called cinema and what is cinematic has now seems to be very much up for grabs. Or rather one has to redefine it at every turn, what it means for each, uh, each practice. So there are some things that have stayed with me. I'm not, a very, I'm not very comfortable making grand pronouncements on the state of the world in any which way. And I tend to work very closely on particular artists and their work. So that's sort of where it goes. I'm not, I, I don't seem to, and I think at some point I have to be a little more grown up about it and make something grand. Like say, so what is the contemporary Agamben? Or like say, so what is it that makes Indian art practice? But I'm not, I'm not there yet. I just can't get myself to do that. So I'm going to begin where I, where I do, where I used to live in the diaspora, where I live in the United States, but I used to live in Washington, D.C., so the first artist that I actually took on the task of doing, because I really had, did not want to work on film anymore, and I wanted to take a break from it. But of course, you can only go that far, right? So the question in my mind was always like, what would some artist, why would an artist who's, a, who's usually accustomed to meeting with curators be interested in a film study scholar? Like, why would that be even remotely interesting, right? And this included proper, not only artist visits, studio visits with them, thinking about their work, etc. So the first artist whose work I saw was at a, at a makeshift library, provisions library in Washington, D.C., and she was a sick American artist called Raj Kamal Kalon, who now lives in Berlin. And her work, and I've written about it in her catalog, but she has said, I'm just going to use her word. She says she's a maximalist, but what I was interested in, which I continue to be interested in, is in the status of the archive itself. And she's a book art person, so she, what she does is take middle brow books, and I've and she sort of tears it apart and starts painting on them, etc. And she is a very accomplished painter. So there she is. That's part of the work. And this is on PowerPoint because the internet is a little slow. Otherwise, I would have clicked on it. And I've written about a couple of these pieces. So let me just stand up and tell you what the pieces are. Okay, so that one and this one. And then, so, okay. So I'm particularly, sorry. I'm particularly interested in in how to read, how to read these images, right? So I was, I was actually quite impressed by the way in which she uses the two-faced sheets of book and how she'd connect those images, right? And uh, I'm also interested in the long history of middle brow books where you've got older lithographs and paintings and then sort of that etching, and then over that she works through the paintings. So this is Castle's History of India that she had bought at Sotheby's, and all of this is on her website anyway, and the ways in which she works through it. And there's a long sort of the bandaged figures, etc., which is in my writing. So this is in the, it's in the published run. And I, and I have to say that I was completely taken up with her raid into the archive, is what I call it. Okay, and she's sort of, she just raids it, tears it apart, etc. And um, I forget, I mean, she went to Whitney, but there's a Pakistani artist, and I'm sorry, I'm a little, like, slow on this, 
who also is quite involved with book art, maybe if the card can immediately think about it, who, who, who paints homoerotic paintings on inside books, whose work was at the Asia Society. So I think of them as in conversation, right? Um, I don't know, you can give me any name. Anything. I don't remember the name. It's a map, I mean, yeah. I won't know who it is. On your side, right, had book. And I really like the defacing of books and archives. It also makes a film, I mean, somebody like me who thinks the archive, I, I never thought the archive was a great, precious place, but it does make, the, it does, does underscore how provisional the archive is and how much we have to do our own work in collecting, etc., and how things get left behind. So this is, this is uh, Cologne's work. And Cologne's work has moved off in a different, and the, the last part of the essay deals with her work when she, she starts etching and then screen printing on pieces of marble. So she's got this work that it, which has to deal with the Belgian archive. And for me over there, it was much more of an affective relationship and the chill of the marble, etc. So that allowed me to play with writing and writing about art in a way that I felt freer to do so than I would do with film. And this way of sort of thinking about what it felt to have a different relationship to a whole different kind of a practice. Okay, so that's, this is Raj Kamal, my work on Raj Kamal Kalon. Can I get the next one? Okay, thank you, Harish. Um, yeah, so the next one, yeah, these are some of Ra Raj's works. Okay. Um, yeah, it's the Strangers of Night. This is something that I've written quite extensively about. This is uh, another series that she did, uh, Woman Climbing the Cocoa Tree. And what I'm, sorry, when painting seems to have gone out of fashion, Raj is very much a painter when it comes to it. So she actually paints every day. So for me, that's, that's, the, that's the kind of practice that I'm quite impressed by. Um, it's the dailiness of it as well. Um, okay, stop right there for a second. Yeah, great. So the second, uh, the second artist, uh, artist, I worked, I wrote about was this artist filmmaker Aisha Abraham who went to the Whitney program and she came out of Baroda school and then goes to the Whitney program and then it now lives in Bangalore. She was interested at the same time I was interested in archives and this is my film work but this is, so she works on a, she, she started being interested and we were doing it at the same time. She's a friend of mine so we've been talking quite intensely. She's interested in the survival of eight millimeter film in India. Okay, so that was a big work at that point for her. And I was interested in also looking at lost footage in one of the commercial films I was looking at. And this, this part of writing will come out, but this is, I mean, that part, my work will come out. And this I've written about. And the film that she calls is called Straight Eight. And the essay that I wrote is called Aisha Abraham's Straight Eight, which is up. So I read this really closely. So what she lands up doing is Straight Eight is not preserved at all. And so we both simultaneously ran into the problems of the National Film Archive and its limitations on just preserving 35 millimeter work in Pune and nothing else. And then we, we thought, as we often do, we've all kind of like stuck on these issues, like realize that really there was no eight millimeter, there were no amateur filmmakers? No, because once you start looking for it, it's always there. And Aisha discovered right in her backyard, which means in Bangalore Cant, in Bangalore Cantonment, there was a small eight millimeter society in the 1940s run by this chap and who's the protagonist, who kind of is the protagonist in this work, who turns out Tom Adagier is his name. And he turns out to have, to have worked quite extensively on 8mm. And the films were then transferred by his children who had lived in England into video, video format. So Aisha's work as a digital artist was to use and sort of embalm, as I call it, I actually called it graveyard aesthetics in her case. That was my term for her. So she turns... Uh, turns up sort of preserving the work in various ways. First of all, trying to figure out how to process it, how to put it together from two different sources, right? Both sort of like strands of eight millimeter that are just falling apart with, uh, with uh, vinegar smelling. And then of course the video. So she puts both of them together and then produces this composite film, which is neither a biography nor a story of the eight millimeter in India, nor is it a personal journey. So it's a mishmash of everything. And I think of Aisha's work as one of the last sort of great under underrated work in this area of trying to think about 8mm. It did get a bit of a run. It, it, was, it was part of a collection for Lux Video, and I think that's one of the next frames. No, 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 not that. Just go back. So it's, wow, I didn't expect that to come up. Okay, so uh, just the cover, did I have that? Okay, so uh, Aisha's work gets covered in Lux Video. Lux in the, ninth, in the early 2000s was 
trying to put together Lux Video Review Give it, was trying to put together compendiums of experimental film work. And this was part of, tried part of the collection. So Aisha's work gets collected there. And my essay on Aisha's work is published in a place called New Cinemas, which is very much a film journal. But I was interested in sort of like insisting that one couldn't just look at film in the film journal, that one had to go into the art practice world to do it. There's a couple of works that are similar to Aisha, Sandhya Suri's work and a couple of others who've done this similar sort of finding old footage. And once you start looking for it, it's everywhere. That's the other thing. People have... I mean, not everywhere. I would say there's more than you imagine it to be. That it's not as if the middle class in India had access to eight millimeter cameras, which is which is all the rage in the West, at least in America. But there were. It's not as if they didn't exist either. There was a couple of Maharajas, but it was beyond the Maharajas where people actually shooting stuff. So that's one of the entrees into Asha's work. Yeah, that's. Yeah. Am I going too fast, or is this okay? Okay, okay. Um, and then, uh, sorry. Uh, my my distance from my my distance my growing distance from the long format feature film what what I've never called but what is known as Bollywood has never been of any interest to me so I was very glad to have written on Popper's and Man leaving it so one of the first since about 2006 every summer and I do it every summer I spent about three weeks at the at the film institute in India uh, looking at the diploma films which is a 20 minute film that the filmmaker makes at the end of their year, which can be sometimes four years, five years, six years, but they make this. And these diploma films have a, have an amazing aura about them, and I'm very attached to them. I'm more attached to them than the filmmakers themselves. So I've practically seen every diploma film since it was produced in 1965. So this particular this particular essay that is out there was a diploma films that were made at the very end when Indian when the Film Institute moved from set from 35 millimeter. Is it too loud? No, but you're echoing. Can I just speak? No, you're trying to set the speaker. That's what I'm always mumbling half the time, so I'm very glad if, I'm, if there's a... If there's a uh, okay, is that better? Yeah. Yeah, so much better. Okay. Uh, uh, so this was, this was a batch of students who made films in the 2000s as the Film Institute's last batch of works on celluloid. The Film Institute in India uses what is called, which is like terrifying for somebody who teaches at an American university, that they use what is called the industry standard 35 millimeter film. So does Moscow Film Institute and so does, so does Femi in Paris. So these are very, very odd. To use 35 millimeter in a film school is means that you've already sold out from an art school perspective. So, um, so it's interesting that, but this was the last batch and we've mo uh, FDI has moved completely to digital. And I'm, I'm attached to every year and it's all like, if you've, look at, if you've been looking at an archive since 1965 and I have ways of classifying how to do it, but it's absolutely crazy because you're, you're just like drowning in films and you have no idea what to choose and what to do, etc. But somehow or the other it came, and this was, I should say, just the luck of the draw when an idea comes to you, that the films were part of what I would call the environmental. They were all eco-cinema works for me. So they turned out, and they're just stunning work. And one, I'm, I'm attached to all of them very, very deeply. But there's one that I really love, which has to do with a film that was breaking down. It's, it's, uh, it's Aman Vadwa's work, and he lives in Ludhiana. It's beautiful work about the film processing itself breaking down in the labs at FDI. Um, and processing lab, etc. And he has this, it's called Letter to Corley, which for me is very touching because he did, he kind of, he didn't know, but he knew, but he didn't know. It's, it's an homage to Chris Marker's Letter to Siberia, one of the great first essay films that comes out. So um, Amun's work has that kind of capacity. And then there are other films which have to do with, I mean, they're just kind of just philosophical films on the end of the Anthropocene, the end of it. So this was right during the strike. When the right-wing government had taken over, these films were being made in that, what I think in that context. And it, so for me, they were absolutely, there's nothing else but the title that says it all, The Enchanted World of FDI Films. For me, I mean, I have the deepest attachment to them. So this is the essay on that. And they, each film is about 20 minutes long. Okay. Okay, and I can't show you any right now because of the internet. Issues. Okay, I'm just giving you all a breather. Okay, next. Okay. Uh, wow. Okay, this is a little ahead, but that's okay. Let me just stay with that for a second. There are a couple of works that I have. 
Yeah, just leave it right there for a second. Um, there are a couple of works that I have had, uh, sort of a longer conversation with that I'm, I am actually going to mention them before we get to Ranbir's work, is, um, is Ashri Malawalia's work, and some of you may know it. He made this amazing film called Miss Lovely, which came out. He's a, uh, he works, he comes out of Bard, so he had an experimental film background, but he comes to Bombay and he starts making work very much within sort of like in the Bombay space, but his own kind of an independent work. So, um, and I like the story and I say it because I think it's like a good Biennale story. So at the same point when I was actually sort of, I was in Bombay doing research, I was meeting Akbar Padamsi, India's great abstract expression, abstract painter, who at that point was involved in the 1970s with the vision exchange workshop. Some of you already know about this, I'm sure. So, uh, and Akbar had just returned from Paris and he was going to, sort of figure out a way to have a conversation, a running conversation between filmmakers, musicians, painters, and other artists. And he had got the Baba Fellowship and he was hanging out in Nizamuddin, which was then the kind of the center of artists at point. But he hated Delhi and he came back to his beloved Bombay. So that's what he did. And Duveda, Money Calls Duveda was made from that workshop. But, and also he and Nalini Milani made a couple of works, but Akbar made two works which are really important during that period. And he was trying to become a filmmaker. So Akbar made a work called CG Gi, which is this beautiful animation work with the help of, uh, like, it's considered one of the earliest animators in the, in the, in the commercial space called Ram Mohan. Akbar made CG Gi, which is which the only surviving copy is at the Cinematheque in Paris. So that's one. And then he had another, which is there, which is there, and they've managed to preserve it. You can get, actually, a DVD version of it, which is somewhat okay. So, so, I mean, it's transferred from pneumatic, so it's, it's, it's okay, it works. And it's a, it's a very simple film. It, uh, it's incredibly simple. It just has to do with dots and lines, but it's Akbar's film, and you, can know, and you know it's Akbar's film for that reason. And then he makes a second film called Events in the Cloud Chamber, which is lost. And Akbar would tell me what it was about, etc. It was actually a camera that was put into the processing lab when he was processing film, and that was a film, okay? So at the same time that when I was visiting Akbar and doing my studio visit with Akbar and he was having a couple of sort of setbacks, he, uh, Miss Lovely had just come out and I had known Ashim's work from before. So Akbar would ask me, he'd say, so what films have you seen? Because I'm dying to see and Akbar loves watching films. So I said, I've seen this amazing Miss Lovely. So he said, okay, I really want to see Miss Lovely. So I said, I'll do even better. You watch it and the cinematographer and the director can come. So they didn't know that. Uh, the, the cinematographer is K.U. Mohanan, who knew Akbar's work really well, but Ashim really didn't know who Akbar was. So they land up meeting, and they all have this kind of bromance. All the men, you know, various generations, they just kind of have this love fest. And remember, I'm the one who did that meeting, right? But I sort of like, like, oh, gee, what the hell is happening here? So then what happens is Akbar wants, Akbar decides that Ashim should try to make CGG. That's what he wants. And he wants Mohanan to make CGG. And they both said, no, we don't want to make CGG. It's your film. We want to make events in a cloud chamber. So they make events in a cloud chamber, okay, which becomes, which is kind of an amazing film, which then, while well, Ashim is making his daddy and the other works, which is a commercial, kind of a purely commercial work, he makes this film, which is called Events in a Cloud Chamber, as an homage to, uh, and he, he acknowledges me, which is to great, Ashim's great, I think, graciousness on this matter. But what Ashim does is, because he's, he's also interested in found footage, he takes his family home movie, he's got plenty of home movie footage, and he's used this before in his own small works, short format works, dust, etc. So he mixes it up with the processing work, and there's this very beautiful, beautiful, melancholic, kind of actually affectionate portrait of Akbar as well in it. Akbar in his wheelchair, painting every morning, etc. And Akbar also works every day. It's one of those great things, sort of like the great practice of painting every day. So that, that film took, happened to have Ashim move into the gallery place, his uh, gallery space. And he hates, I mean, till then, he actually never wanted to be in the gallery space. He's a filmmaker and an experimental filmmaker, an avant-garde filmmaker. He would never be part of the gallery space. And then he does show it in Saveri Gallery. And so he has that space all set up. So that's sort of, that's the kind of a complicated way in which found footage lands up with, with filmmakers, or artist, filmmaker, filmmaker, artist, and that as a conversation between generations. Akbar likes the film. He thought it was just kind of great. So okay. we showed it in the film program you did. two weeks ago. Okay. Part of the ah, so you see, I, there's a little acknowledgement to me there uh, <laughs> from Marsha. It's very nice to hear you talk about it. I didn't know about it at all. So that's like, yeah, um, Akbar likes that. And, um, uh, okay, and the setup is, so then, um, sorry, 
Then I have had a, no, actually, can we go, this is a little ahead. Late, no, no, sorry, we have to go forward and then we'll come back to Ranvi. Yeah, that's the one, yeah. No, this one, no. Yeah. So um, this is uh, Anuj Vaidya's Heart of Gold. Anuj Vaidya is a video artist, not a film person, a video artist. And he and I have been having a long curatorial friendship and relationship. He comes out of the Art Institute of Chicago. He lives between India and, um, and uh, America. He's now in a PhD program. But for year, but for two big, I mean, we've had two different curatorial ventures together. We get along quite well. And it's a generational difference of some kind or not. Maybe it doesn't work as a generation. But anyway, it works for us. How about that? So it's very interesting. He's a video artist, and I'm a film person. And uh, so this is his, and I'll tell you briefly, this is his film. This is why I wanted to work with him. This is his work on Helen, and it's, in, it's him in drag. As, he's a video, in this case, he's a video performance artist. And it's called Woman with a Heart of Gold. And, it's, uh, and he's since then worked quite extensively on a long piece with, with uh, Tejal. But in this one, they did a bunch of, they did two, two works together, Tejal, who's like, the, I would say, the video artist auteur from India. So uh, Anuj's work, which I'm particularly kind of, can we have just that light, not Anu? I just want to be able to see people to be able to say this. Anuj's work of Purane, 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 come, 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 come. come. Uh -huh. So uh, Anuj's work is really interesting because he's incredibly obsessed with video formatting. And for this particular work, he extracted stuff from Shemur, Shemru video and Moser video, which are really so awful, right? By the time you get Hindi films on Moser, it's completely degraded. And his, his materiality was actually using stuff from video and then mixing it up with performance art in drag. So this is very, pe so very peculiar ways of thinking about Helen. And it's him in drag and Helen. So... For me, what is interesting, he does it unconsciously. He hates my questions of medium specificity. Okay, so like, really, I don't want to deal with video. But I'm actually very interested because he's fairly rigorous in his using of the medium specificity. So for me, that's really interesting to be able to have that conversation with him. So he's my, he's my co-conspirator. With, uh, with, and we did, two, two, we did a Tamil film series called Cruel Cinema, which I won't talk about. But the second series that we did together was the video art in India. So can we just look at that one? The other times are before we get to Ranveer's work. Yeah. Other species, other times, which is that one. Yeah, no, the one before that. Yeah, this one, yeah. This is other, uh, okay. So I was, I was deep in deep research, in deep research mode with video art, and I was putting stuff together. And Anuj is also interested, and he does work on performance, and his work is sort of thinking about the environment and animality and other things. So this, we had to compromise, so this is it. So other times is mine and other species. He says, I'm not that interested in species if they don't have temporality to them, I think. That's what I told him. But we landed up putting it together. So this, for me, is very important because we landed up, we landed up curating the show. And if I can sort of see something, I and mean, if I had the, if you had access to the net, I would show you what it would look like. Because what we were obsessed with. No, 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 it just sort of, it's like, it goes round and round. We can't do it. Actually, you can look it up. It's actually on, online in various places. But let me tell you what we were sort of, what we wanted to obsess about. Almost all the video artists, no, all of them, in fact, all of them, uh, there was one bunch of them that came from Chatterjee and Lal, the gallery in, uh, a gallery in uh, Bombay. But the choice was very much ours. Uh, and this is Kaleka's work, Ranveer Kaleka's work. They were all show, their works were all between two channel to three channel video. And if there were three channel video channels or two, that was one thing. The second thing was also they were showing it in video monitor. Like Sonia Kurana's work was very much in a very small video monitor where you had to lie on the floor and Kiran Nadar and watch it, etc. But what we did was curated it as a film repertory space, okay, which is like a whole different matter altogether because gallery work and film work are really sort of, they're not commensurable in any which way. But we did have the artist's permission to do it. So the big, I've introduced this so many times, so I have to keep insisting because I land up showing it in a space like this with single, which is single projection condition, and the works are shown in one continuous. And we're very proud of the sequencing. It took forever to figure out which work should follow which ones. So this was like the biggest intervention, I would say, as far as, I would say my probably favorite risk-taking, high risk-taking 
uh, curatorial intervention in terms of trying to sequence them, uh, like how they would go together, etc. And um, I mean, what one would follow, and that was the cinematic uh, intervention for me. I've shown it. We, it was inaugurated the Pacific Film Archives, the gra very nice repertory space. It traveled to the Experimental Response Cinema in Austin, where we showed it in uh, in an old theater. But it also at every place it was shown in a theatrical situation, not in a gallery place. So it has a totally different effect because you, you're forced to sit down. You can't really leave the black box situation. And it's enormous. The scale of it looks really big. And sometimes, I think all the artists loved it. So they said it was a different work. They didn't expect their work to look like this. The cover had Ranbir Kalaka, who's... This is uh, Kaleka's, Kaleka's work. Um, how many of you know Kaleka? You should know Kaleka's work if you haven't. Yeah, for me, he's probably one of the most sort of magical video artists from India, he's Punjabi. And um, Kaleka's work for me, and I'll say very briefly why I find it interesting, um, and there are many, many things why I find Kaleka's work interesting, is that it moves between painting and projection. And for me, that is so evocative. And it doesn't, and you have no idea where projection ends and where painting begins in his work. And it's just sort of, it's totally magical. And you're standing there thinking, like, what is it? And it's, of course, it's a painting. No, it's not a painting. It's moving. It's moving. And then you can see the whole thing moving. And Kaleka does this exquisitely. And they're all so melancholic. And there's a man threading um, uh, threading a needle. And it's just one of those great... Uh, there's another one called Kettle. And so what lands up happening soon thereafter is that I write a long essay on Kaleka's work. And uh, can we move? So I write... Kaleka's got a bunch of work that is... Yeah, so this one... Then this is Kaleka's work on the kettle, which I'm very, very attached to, very attached to. And move to, yeah. So this is the, this was the catalog that came out on Kaleka's work. And so Kaleka's work is, of course, Kaleka is everything. He's a painter, he's a photographer, he's a digital print. He does everything. But I'm interested in Kaleka's moving image work, especially the stuff that is called video art. But it really isn't video art. It's somewhere between painting and video art. Uh, can we just go up? Yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry, up. Yeah, up, up, please. Yeah. So that's the one that I, oh, it's just so, it's really sad and beautiful. And this is at Volta Gallery. Um, yeah, and there's just so, yeah, so I can tell you more about the works if you want to hear about them. So, yeah, it's an easy, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And when the light is really bright in the gallery space, you can't really see the painting. So you kind of like, what's there? And then it stops. And there's another one that I write at the end of the essay on Kaleka. It's on a cell phone that is in the park. That, and it's backlit. And you just think of it as, oh, it's just backlit. It's painted on glass work, painting on glass or something. No, it isn't. It's actually, it's painting. And then it, it moves. And then it moves up. And it moves in. And you're not sure when. So I think the Kaleka is able to do two different things. And I think Sonia Kurana and him are... are probably the two people who worked very, very closely on this. This is something for a cinema person, which is so, so mesmerizing, is the idea of the loop. Uh, Sonia, Sonia and him have very, very fine sense of what a loop is. And, and I, in that way, both Kaleka and Kurana are, I mean, are classically trained as video artists to understand what a loop is. Something that for, for us, for, for me, working as something cinema, for me, it's the biggest it's the biggest lesson, it's the biggest gift that video artists have given somebody like me to work on it so closely because you really have to pay so much attention to this thing called loop, which doesn't exist as any kind of category for a cinema studies person. And it's just, and people do loops and they're like, huh, you've never seen a Kaleka loop, I tell them. I've never seen a Kurana loop, that's a loop. They know how to do a loop. So there are, I mean, I, uh, <coughs> so anyway, so I love Kaleka's work for that reason. Okay, you can literally walk in, walk out, and then come back to it. So I do, I do think they're just, they really have such a deep command on their, the medium specificity. Okay, this is a shout out to Ranbir and, and Sonia. But Sonia, if you'd seen the other, like if I could pull out other, other species other times, you would have seen Sonia's work, which is just beautiful as well. Okay, so I just want to make sure that I've covered some of this. Yeah, how much time do I have? Yeah. I've really, yeah. but I can take questions. Yeah. yeah, okay, so I have one last thing. God, I've just run through it. That's a pretty fast. <laughs> okay. No, no, I feel like I've just rushed. Am I rushing? No, no, you take your time and then we'll ask questions. We have 10 minutes. Oh, okay, good. Mm. So as you can tell, the archive largely has been sort of South Asian, South Asian diaspora, my archive, and I've been working through it. 
But then I also feel like I live at the university, right? For the most part, most of us teach at the university and we have friendships in the university and that's what it is. That's where we spend most of our time. So um, it's so interesting. I was sitting in the audience and I saw somebody playing video games when Iftikhar was giving his talk. And I thought, look at the space we've all entered. It's kind of amazing. Somebody was actually playing a video game in front of me. I thought, like, wow, that was something else. That was really something else. Um, a shooter game, no less. Um, okay, so um, what is interest? What I, I, uh, what I want to sort of go back is to the university because artists don't live just in galleries; they also teach the university. And for somebody working on the experimental scene, what is what is particularly evocative? Hey, I recognize you. Hi. <coughs> um, is that? is that artists, that the American avant-garde would not be what it is if, if most of them didn't work at universities. Uh, Brackage and Sunny, uh, and Sunny Buffalo were one of the great hotspots and the biggest draws and Binghamton for the American avant-garde to work over there. So I actually think the university is so, so under, underrated as a space of deep art practice. Okay, and I say this because I'm not interested in getting obsolete myself and I don't want distant learning and all of these things to exist. I do believe in the university as a medieval space. And I do think the university is one of the greatest American spots, actually, and which is definitely under duress. So having said that, I also want to say that the American art scene, as you know, is incredibly wedded to capitalism. So one never understands what the university space looks like. But I have a colleague on whose work I've just started writing. And so I wanted to sort of sketch what it means when I don't work in a place like if I'm not working in my South Asian archive, right? So then you run into. So I ran into, and we've now become friends, ran into a Polish artist who teaches at UT, Bogdan Prajanski's work. So let's see, this would come up on, okay? So what is interesting about somebody, that's, that's, that, hang on, come down. Just come down. <laughs> Before Bogdan. Yeah, so this is what? This is Sahaj's work. This was the one. Uh, so this I wanted up there. And this is on the program. Okay, up. And so this is, there must be, okay, we can go to the website, actually. Okay. So Bogdan was trained in Poznan in Poland, and I'm kind of interested in that space. Um, for the, for the, okay. Okay, yeah. So what's interesting is that it's a space that is not dissimilar. Yeah, that's the space. Thing. It's a space and practice that is not dissimilar from, from those of us in the subcontinent, right? They're under Soviet totalitarianism, or they're a satellite. And then what happens is that you land up producing that, actually our training is somewhat familiar. We understand that we actually have to be trained in philosophy. And Bogdan is kind of like this crazy artist who can do everything. Like, I've never known anybody like that in my, in my limited space. Um, of thinking about art practice. If he has to paint, he mixes his own paints. If he has to put together like pottery, he'll make his own pottery. And he's now he's been a digital artist for about 25 years now, and he makes his own computers and he makes his own uh, customizes his camera. So it's a bit it's a bit crazy, I think, as an artist not practice. This is Epimentius, his work, which is kind of uh, quite lovely, very very, and. Um, Epimentius was Prometheus's very slow-witted brother, okay, who loved slow stuff. So everything moves very slowly in Epimentius, okay, which I'm very, so I'm, I really like this work very much. The work that I'm sort of particularly attached to, and I, I'm sort of in the middle of writing about it, can we move down? This is Table, uh, which is all about grids, etc. So Bogdan's work is between science and technology, and he's been heading the studio art program in Transmedia for 25 years. So move down, move down, one more. One more, yeah. So this is forest. This is that forest, and I can't pronounce it in Polish. It's a forest in Poland. Uh, go down. Yeah, that's it. So that's the coordinates of it. So it's a two-channel. It's a two-channel video work. No, go back. This is earlier work. Yeah, this one. This one. I'm, this one is kind of like I think an, an extraordinary piece of work. So it's um, it's it's in a black box condition with two channels, and. Uh, it's, it was shot in that forest, um, and it runs in a loop. No, just stay there. Thank you. Um, and this is how it works. You get into it, and if you stand there very quietly, the forest 
is very quiet. And if you start moving, then it, I mean, it moves when you're really quiet. And if you start moving, then it stops. So it, it was one of these sort of early sensor work in 2008. And I'm very attached to it because it allows me to think about ecology and cinema on the one hand, which I'm interested in. But I'm also interested in thinking about it in terms of digital sensors. And I haven't seen any work of this caliber anywhere before, which this kind of meditative. And I mean, for somebody who to actually build it ground up, and that's. So, so it's accompanied by later work. Go back, please. No, back, back. Piche. 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 Okay. Okay, go back. Sorry. So forward. Sorry. I'm so sorry about this. Okay. <coughs> go ahead. Yeah, okay. That's good. So um, he's also been working with drone technologies, and he builds his own kind of drones, etc. So there's like lots of work which has to do with movement and rotation. And uh, as I said, his work is between science and technology. So that's sort of, and for me, what is of interest is to wander off into a space. And I was very touched to see that amazing work, the 10 channel work at the Lahore Biennale, which Iftikhar had said, I should definitely go. Al Mughal, um, uh, Ina Artamova and German Popov's work, right? Which is just, so it's a kind of work that speaks to this particular training, the former Soviet republics, and though Poland isn't, it's just merely sort of in the influence of the Soviets for a very, very long time, under the influence, I should say. But um, <coughs> there's this kind of obsession with science and science fiction that these artists have, and I'm very drawn to this, trying to think about it, and yet they're also sort of thinking very deeply about ecology. Bogdan is a philosopher, so he writes about uh, ecology. So I'm interested in that kind of work, and also very impressed and surprised that we can talk to each other because I feel like we come from such different worlds, but we seem to have similar connections and obsessions. So part of, the, part of this is also to start thinking that several of our artists actually, because I want to enact what happens to several of my artists, they go off somewhere else, and they're able to have these conversations and friendships with people across. And so what happens when we do it in the university where you're running into somebody all the time, and you look at their work and say, like, really, that person can do this amazing work? So you're kind of thinking through that as well. So that's, the, that's to think of the university also as a lab, as a place of, of real practice, as everyday practice. Okay. So I can take any number of questions and any kind of question. Not any number. Did I say any number by mistake? No, I meant any kind. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> yeah, please. Okay, so um, so the meta question. What is film today? What is video today? What, you know, like, you know, how do we think about genre? Through, through digital. It's all in the digital, right? That's, it's as algorithms. That's why, it's, for me, it's fun to go to somebody like Bogdan's work, because he's been a digital artist before anybody else has, so he's been working with notions of algorithms for such a long time. So for me, that's interesting, because it allows, because some of the, some of the artists I work don't really, can't really do that. They'll say, how, usko I mean, like, they, they subcontract all that work, right? But then when you meet somebody who can build all this, then you know that you're asking a different set of questions. So I would say that the point of, and I hate this word, and I will use it no, I don't want to use it. I'll use it. Uh, what, uh, what American cinema studies people call convergence, which I hate that word, because I think it flattens out the differences between different mediums, so I don't want to use it. My own term, and I've been very attached to it, and you also use it, is intermediality, so that the, t so that the differences in formats sustain themselves through it in some manner or another. In some manner or another, because we do know they're being used through digital. So for me to head off I think, what is cinema for? I think, for example, I always, it's not an, un, that's why the loop, for instance, for me, is such an amazing sort of video, but you know, it has to be programmed, so it's already has a digital interference to it. So that's interesting for me, that you have to program it as a loop. So there's that. Um, and for me, that would be one thing that would come out of like the way in which, I don't think the, fo it's like they're always hugging another format, right? So for example, Ranbir is never going to give up painting. Yeah. Right, and he's going to call something. It's actually digital video art these days, right? And that's going to be the relationship. But I'm interested in that they're all obsessed with projection, which is mine. I think projection is mine. That's cinema. That's what we do. So why don't we do? And so I'm interested in people like Anthony McCall. Always, I'm not the only one interested in McCall. Everybody is interested because he does projection. So the idea of I'll tell you what happened. This is a sort of side story. When I was at FTI, and I love this story because it's such a like film school. Like I, you know, since I teach in my film school. The, I remember saying, let's watch it. And they said, huh, we'll watch in the main theater. We can watch a main theater film. And they'll sit down and they did this. I have to give you the full body expression of this. They say, with the 
perfectionist who's sitting there. Chalo yaar, that's what they say. They're like, yeah. So they said, huh? I said, sound, sound, focus, focus. I said, are you guys crazy? You're not projecting your own works? So they said, no, there's always going to be somebody projecting my own work. I said, no, that doesn't work anymore. I said, you have to learn to project your own work. You just cannot, you have to sit in the projection room. You can't be sitting next to me. I said, no, I mean, this is what, so it was like a whole, and I said, why do you think the film is already over? You can go up and play with lensing and projection. I said, for the American Avanga, the film is never done. It's never done. Why have we both sold out to industrial stuff? Like a big fight for the next few days on this matter. Big fight. And how can you say that? It's on. It's just unimaginable, and then they all got converted in some manner, knowing that, okay, such a world exists, but then, but I thought this sort of like macho behavior doing this, saying, hey, chalo, yaar, you know, they're like, wow, this is like a whole nother world of like, you can see what's going to happen to them, right? They're going to land up, they're going to become big short filmmakers, they'll go to premieres, and they'll have somebody sort of like saying, run it for us. So they kind of do-it-yourself kind of ethics, which I would greatly think of as the American University's biggest contribution to art practice, that daily practice of knowing how the parts are put together, yeah. right? Yeah. So, I mean, the idea that you should know how to, which is where the Soviet, where Polish training is kind of like mind-boggling. They all put together their own cameras. They can completely undo everything and then put it all together. You know, so those kinds of things are pretty, I mean, it's pretty great. It's like dealing with the Renaissance, right? You're sort of dealing with some... So that practice, and he's not, I, uh, I mean, Bogdan is extraordinary, but I don't think he's singular. I think there are people who know how to do these kinds of things, and I'm interested in sort of having that space, and we've kind of lost that to a large extent in film schools. So I think artistic practices allow us to ask very basic questions on how to put together something. So uh, the answer, it's a roundabout answer to say that the questions of process, which is never important for filmmakers, it's always important for an artist. Filmmakers never barely talk, except in a film school situation, they'll never talk about process otherwise. But isn't it all process when you're like storyboarding and like... Yeah, 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 it is, but they don't know how to talk about it, is what I mean. Okay, okay. Yeah, 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 it's not. Of course it's always process, but they have no idea that they're, they're philosophizing their process. And many of them don't storyboard anywhere. They can't draw to save their lives or sketch or do anything, yeah. Yes, please. I know, you're from yesterday. Yeah, sure. So, um, Ranbir is very generous. Ranbir really doesn't care what happens to his work, except when he has control over the gallery show. I have to say this. What happened, but Man with a Cockroach, which I love. Can we see that image? I'll show you the cover. We showed these two. I've written at my other species, huh? this is the one, other species. When I wrote my essay on Ranbir's work, I didn't write about Man with a Cockroach, but I can tell you about this work. This is such an extraordinary piece of work. Okay, so let me tell you briefly what happened. Sudhir Patwardhan, the other, uh, an artist based in Bombay who works sort of, who's an amazing sort of painter, he and his, he and his partner took a bunch of works as a tour through, through Maharashtra. So this work had gone with them. And of course, they couldn't set up proper gallery spaces, which are incredibly upmarket. So they set it up on video monitors as single, sort of just like bunch of works, right? So Ranbir had said, okay, if Sudhir is doing it, why don't you just take that version? I'll give you this version of it. So I got that version that Sudhir had shown. So this is how it functions. Tell me if I can stand up. I can show you this. So this is cuts in half, okay? It's in a water. It's in water, and the guy is standing with a cockerel. And then you run it. Oh, it is just kind of mind-boggling how beautiful it is. It's sort of... Uh, you can't tell this. There are just sort of like four different ways in which it works. You can't tell where the reflection is and where that is, and the cockerel kind of makes <coughs> all different hands. And then the reflection also morphs differently. So if you think of it as a grid, it's four ways, okay? And um, and and it's fun. It's what you have to think about Kareka. It's incredibly sad, some of Kareka's work. I always sort of land at home studio with them, start crying at the end of the day. Uh, but there is, but yeah, Kareka is so playful with the medium. He's, I mean, that's the play with medium because incredible confidence in trying to really maintain that space. Let's see. Yeah. Oh, you found it. Yeah, you find it. Oh, it's there. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Yeah, wow. But it's not, I mean, the duration is a bit off because it's buffering a lot. Uh, and you shouldn't have kind of but like there, you should have another day now. Okay. So this is, this is kind of work.
find it? I just Googled it. Wow. It's a bit weird. Okay, I think we should stop it. I'm feeling very uncomfortable about this suddenly. Okay, yay. Okay, sorry. Suddenly feeling a little weird that it's on Google somewhere. <laughs> okay. Does that, does that, oh yeah. So that's, yeah, and no, no two works are the same. This is, a, there's one at the train station with the family crossing, and there's one in the Delta, in the, in the Ganges Delta, just north of Calcutta. That's another, I mean, there's so many of these works, it's just like these moving image works. Hmm? And they're different. It's not, some of them have projection, and they're like between easel and projection. Some of them are backlit, and, um, and uh, some of them are like two-channel video works. And there's another one. I mean, there's several of them that move, the screens move as well, so workers. Ashish Rajadaksha put his work alongside the Zhuangu Biennale, right alongside Uski Roti, Mani calls Uski Roti. That was the, and I have a different reading of that. I wouldn't juxtapose those works in that way. Okay, so it's, uh, but that was Ashish's curatorial. Uh, that was his arrangement. Yeah, but it has to do, for me it's very, no, for me it's, it's very, it doesn't really work for me because the skiroti is so static yeah, yeah. and Kaleka is so dynamic, yeah. so it doesn't work at all, but I think it's different. I mean, I think for Ashish, he wanted to bring Mani Kohl's work into the gallery space, so that was it. That was the, and that is, that's an important way to think about it, yeah. Did you find the works interesting? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. And then you've got this amazing sound design, right? That has you thinking about all kinds of other things. So that's Kaleka. Oh, it's just, it's just, and then you know, the sound will, at times, when he's a good man, like, you, you feel like you're standing right there. Um, I remember, I, I mean, I wish I had my essay. This, I'm very proud of one line. There's one, the telephone will start ringing, in the telephone thing. Anyway, you have to read my essay on that, because I can't tell you. I think I wrote that one line, I thought, okay, finish for the day. <laughs> that was like... <laughs> I wrote one line that day, and I thought, like, that's it, I can't. It was just like one of those great sort of writing days when one line was doing the job. And is that the case from uh, the mirror? Does someone have to kill a soldier? There's that. But Kaleka actually has kind of, a very complicated relationship to cinema. He doesn't really, he's not really interested in film. He doesn't even watch it. Like, Akbar is obsessed with film like dirtier, trashier work. So for him, it was like, I mean, so it's very different, very different ways of thinking about, like the other mediums, right? I think he's very much still in the painterly, likes reading, so it's very, very different preoccupations. Yeah, that's it, I guess. Thank, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. And Nalita's visit was sponsored by Amit, so I wanted to thank you. Yeah, actually, uh, this is a good occasion for me to do my official thanks. Thanks to Kamran and thanks to Iftika for, for, for inviting me to.